This is Joe Matarese. I got problems, and they need fixing. I'm afraid, all right? And you're going to have to go through hell. It's worse than any nightmare that you ever dreamed. If I can change, and you can change, everybody can change. You're listening to Fixing Joe. Every week, I'm going to bring my real-life problem to this podcast. My friends, my listeners, my guests, my family, they're all going to help me. And trust me, I need it. I got tons of problems. I'm anxious. I have OCD. I have ADD. I'm narcissistic. I'm insecure. I got anger out the ass. And all these things come together to ruin my life all the time. I'm hoping this show can help. You're listening to Fixing Joe. Hey everybody, how are you? Welcome, welcome to a new Fixing Joe. Thanks for checking it out. Thanks for coming back. If you're a long time listener, we got a good show. Gonna be trying to keep it tight. We've had some long episodes the past three or four, right? Gonna try to start keeping shows to more like an hour fifteen max, uh, maybe hour twenty max. We got a great show today uh, on the podcast. Funny man, a fucking hilarious comedian that I've known for many years. Tom Rhodes, if you know Tom Rhodes, he's hilarious. Tom Rhodes, uh, God, him and I go way back. He's living out in California now. Guy's been touring the world doing comedy for many, many years now. One of the rare comedians that's from America but performs fucking everywhere. I mean, this guy has been fucking everywhere. I don't know why I'm cursing so much at the top. Big fan of Tom Rhodes. Had a sitcom years and years ago on NBC when he was a long-haired, like, rocker comedian. There was, like, a time where a lot of us comedians had the long hair, you know? Um, and he was, uh, he was like the... T- <laughs> he was like the king of the cool comedians. And... uh He's always been like a, I, I don't know how to explain him. He's kind of like, you know, he's like a, I don't know, just a chill dude. And uh, I was glad to get him on the podcast. And he gives me great advice on on my issue. And that is uh, this anger outburst that's new. If you've been following me on Twitter, at the Joe Matarese, all of a sudden I'm wondering, is it Adderall? Is Adderall combining with coffee? It just, I'm just like spazzing out over shit. In the last week, I had about three blow-ups, one of them with the snowblower that I had. You know, we got like, fuck, how much snow did we get in the past few days? And we had like a 26-inch snowstorm. I knew it was coming. I went out to Home Depot, and I bought a, I bought a snowblower. I only spent 400 bucks, bought the cheapest good Toro <laughs> snowblower, so I had to snow blow like three times to knock out the 20 uh six inches that we had i just every eight every eight to nine inches i just went out there and did the whole property so i did it three times but when i got the snow blower i spazzed out trying to get oil into the the snow blower i, I didn't have a <laughs> i didn't have a funnel and i couldn't figure it out i just lost my mind I don't want to explain the whole thing because you're going to hear a lot of it on today's podcast when I'm getting advice from from some callers at the beginning and also uh, Tom Rhodes. And I also give Tom some advice about his life and some of the things that uh, he's gone through since I've seen him, which has been a really long time. So, uh, yeah, so that's what was going on. I don't know if it's the Adderall. I don't know if I need to up the Celexa to a higher milligrams. Do I need to not drink coffee when I'm on Adderall? What is it? Who knows? We're going to figure it out on uh, this podcast. Right here at the top, I want to go to the phones and try to get uh, some of the regulars to give me some advice on this issue. Okay, so uh, let's cut right to the phones right now. All right, let's give uh, Carlo Valente. We all know Carl. Let's give him a call, see if he has any advice, see if he knows what the heck's going on with my brain here. Thanks to Skype. Skype should be a sponsor of the Fixing Joe podcast. Italia. Hey, Joe. Italia. 
Oh, I All I one. see is a picture of Italy. It looks wonderful. <laughs> hey, Italia. Oh, yeah. All right, I think I got that now. Nice. All right. Look at you, an Italian guy with like an Arab beard. I wasn't expecting that. <laughs> yeah, I know. Everyone hates it. Actually, my mom calls me the Jew because, <laughs> because of my hair and the beard. <laughs> That's the, that's the beauty. You look like you just got off of a de- desert island or something. <laughs> well, when I was at the airport, I w- we went to Vegas with my buddies this year because we all turned uh, 40. Mm-hmm. Um, I was the only guy who got stopped at all the airports. <laughs> Jesus. Well, look at you. You might have to lower your volume of hair. I think I'm echoing back a little bit. Uh, yeah, a little bit of an echo. How's that? Uh, that sounds good. So, uh, so what do you got for me? What do you think? What All right, do you think's here's my going question on? for you. Um, what happened just before you blew up at your wife <laughs> with the oil on the snowblower thing? Well, I was in the garage, and I was trying to finagle it. I'm still echoing, by the way. I was in the garage still, you know, finagling with trying to get this oil into the little hole in the bottom of the snowblower. Right. I had this piece of plastic and I kept curling it to try to make a, a, a like a tube so I could stick it in the hole and use it as a funnel. Right. And, and it wouldn't work. And then uh, I was just fuming like I was like like I was I was physically holding the yell from coming out of my body so my neighbors couldn't hear me cuz I have like old neighbors on one side they're in their like 80s and if they hear some Italian guy in their his garage yelling mother fuck and I haven't gotten like that in a very long time and it felt like the old me I went inside cuz I needed to get a ladder from her to try to get up to this higher level in my garage to grab a shovel and mm-hmm. it took like an extra second for my son to answer the door. And my wife came to the door and I just went, ah, ah, I just like yelled right in her face. I can't even articulate to you exactly what words came out of my mouth because she just she was she didn't do anything wrong. Right. right. And, I, and, it, and it's coming from a couple of days ago where I yelled at her for some other thing that was like nothing. And she's like, I could see the look in her face like the old Joe is back. And. It's something I didn't say at the beginning of the podcast is that there was a time when I tried Ridlin years and years and years ago, probably like 10 years ago, when we didn't have any kids and we were just dating. And I can remember screaming at her over the phone when the it was like the Ridlin had worn off and I just felt mm-hmm. like out of control with my anger. And I had said something to my wife like, this medication makes me really nasty when it wears off. And she goes, you know, I don't, I don't mind it because you're so focused when you're on it that I'll take you yelling. And I was like, really? And, and then I had warned her this time. I said, you know, I'm trying this, spe- you know, it's speed basically. And I might, I might get nasty again and she, uh, uh. when it wears off. And she goes, okay, I'm all right. And now... She doesn't. She doesn't accept that as an answer. Like, she doesn't. She like how she was when we didn't have kids. Isn't how she is now. Like now, right. it's like, no, 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 go. You're not yelling at me. Like, what the hell? You got to. You got to maybe, maybe up your medication. Is what she said. Try a higher milligram. You've been on that really low amount. Well, it could be that your body built up a tolerance to it, um, and uh, it just. Okay, so b- b- back to the issue <laughs> at hand here. Um, well. I got I got two theories on what it might be. Um, obviously, if you have coffee with the Adderall, and uh, and I did my doctor stuff, mm-hmm. basically you got speed on top of speed. But because Adderall contains um, two different types of ingredients, and with the coffee on top of it, depending on how strong you take your coffee and what it is, it's both going to agitate each other. I don't think it'll work together. So based on the fact that maybe you've been taking it so long, and your body could have built up a tolerance to it, and then you got that coffee just agitating it. Uh-huh. I think that could be it. I think that could be it. Do, um, are there certain coffees that have more caffeine than other ones, like just yeah, off-the-shelf uh, K-Cups that I'm buying? Well, yeah, depending on what great – here we go. Um, I like my coffee Italian roast, which is pre- basically a medium roast. Me too. But 
Some people drink it like a light roast, and that actually has more caffeine than they know because it's sitting in there at less amount of time, so they're roasting the coffee. So obviously, the darker the coffee, you're going to get a little bit more bitter taste, but the less caffeine it has. So if you're doing middle to light roast on coffee, you're getting more caffeine than the norm. Okay. And that could... That could totally uh, that could totally screw with you. Wouldn't that be hilarious if I went to a doctor and he goes, "I have the solution." I'm like, "What?" He goes, "Light roast." <laughs> you might want to go with the blonde, the blonde roast at Starbucks. Starbucks I highly blonde. recommend Starbucks blonde. <laughs> yeah, I do like. It must be an Italian thing. I hate light coffee. I like I like even dark roast. Okay, yeah. it could be that. It because I said that to my wife. She goes, "You need to do something. You need to up the Celexa." I said, "Why don't I just try less uh, n- or no no coffee in the morning when I take the Celexa?" Because I take how, it as soon well, as I wake up. Not how, Celexa. How long, I mean the Adderall. Adderall. How long have you been drinking coffee? Or is this new that you've been back on it? Well, it's. I heard, I heard an old episode of yours where you said you. you um, I think it was yours. Where you said you um, just started taking up coffee, you, you've been away from it for like five or something years. Was that yours? Was that your mm-hmm. podcast? I don't know. I, I, I know that I wasn't an alcohol drinker when I was uh, dating my wife. All the way up to that time, I wasn't an alcohol drinker, and I am now. And I also wasn't a coffee drinker, and I am now. So it's not like I stopped and started. I, 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 I may have stopped for like a few months, but I never stopped for five years. But okay. definitely I'm not a guy that grew up, you know, drinking coffee. It's like I didn't drink coffee till I was like 40. Oh, espresso was on the table, I think, cause before I could even walk. That thing went... <laughs> That thing went down like nothing. Like the women's business. Are you one of those Italians that has the espresso maker in the kitchen and the? Uh, oh yeah, amaginette. That's what you got to call it with the Navidad accent. Amaginette. Amaginette. <laughs> do, do you have like a? I know Italians. Do you have like one of those meat cutters in your basement too? You don't have one of those, do you? Do you make uh, homemade wine? Uh, my uncle does. I help my uncle sometimes. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, we had the super in the in the in the basement uh, until my parents they just sold their house. But yeah, over the winter, you got you got the sausage hanging from the ceiling. <laughs> Dude, you're, you're, did you ever hear that Brian Regan bit where he would say the guys would uh, would would hit a Spanish accent just for one word? <laughs> they would go today the water the agua is uh, thirty two degrees. You just did it with a super sad. A super sad. <laughs> a super sad. <laughs> I love it. That's what's sad. All right, so you think maybe maybe I try removing the coffee and then we talk again next week and see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, uh, Carlo <laughs> Valente. A super sad. A super sad. All right. <laughs> I can't wait till I have a really Italian issue. You're my go to. Sounds like a plan. Good luck, Joe. All right, man. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, fucking Carlo's classic. Love this guy. All right, we'll just do one other call, it looks like. I think that's all we're going to have today. And I don't see uh, our boy, our boy uh, Chris P, is in, uh, isn't getting bad. Doesn't look like he's around. Ron Poliquin, we all know Ron. Let's see what he's got. Oh, he sent me, you got to do the request first. I love, oh God, this is hilarious. He's got like, <laughs> that was the greatest picture ever, Ron. Hey man, what's up? How are you? Good. Look at you with the headset. Look at you. You sounded like you're on the radio. Is that how you do your podcast? <laughs> no, nah, I don't have a podcast. I'm not a <laughs> aspiring podcaster. Oh, I thought everybody had one. Dude, you look. You know who you look like? A young Roberto Duran. <laughs> <laughs> no mas. <laughs> um, now it's funny. I mixed up. Uh, I mixed up Carlo with a different guy. I thought Carlo uh, had a had a limo job. He's like, no, I'm a I'm a con- general contractor. See, what you need is want to get one of those like uh, things that the FBI have of all the mobsters and everything to say with all the details. Of which guy is who? Yeah, <laughs> and you're because I know you're the guy who lives in Delaware. Who um, I was mixing you up with Fatso Brown because Fatso Brown is the one who. Uh, who uh geez, geez, now i'm fuck i'm add fatso brown he's the Br- he's the british he's guy the right british guy yeah yeah yeah. he's the british guy but i was uh <laughs> I'm, I'm mixed... he has a podcast he has a podcast exactly so wh- what's your advice what do you think on this situation 
Well, I would say, I would say, are the the outbursts that you're having are they are this situational? Is it something that's happening like every day? Is there something that's like going on? Are these just two? Because I heard, I actually heard you on the DePaulo podcast about your situation with your wife. Did I explain? Yeah, what did I? How did that come across that I, when I was talking about that? Did I sound like I was in a? I was brawling with her. No, man. I, I, I mean, I completely understand both your wife's uh, point of view and your point of view. Mm-hmm. You know, like, yeah. it, it, I mean, I could see why you would explode on her, and I could see why she would be frustrated about you being late and everything. It's just that one of those tense situations in the morning where you're kind of like uh, everything has to be timed perfectly, and she sees you, you know, trimming your beard at a certain time. She's thinking this is Joe again running late, and it's going to screw up everything. Yeah, I'm forgetting that whole incident because, yeah, I'm just talking. I was talking about the isolated incident when I yelled at her when I was trying to put oil in the in the snow blower. But oh, you didn't for- explain that one. On, I don't think you explained that on DePaulo's one. You, no, said, you said something about the snow blower. Um, that's when it was for completely no reason. Like that time when she said, (laughs) you're late. Like that. I just yelled. It's funny how I know I should never yell. Shut. Once you have kids, you know, you don't yell shut up to anybody. It's like, if you, if I ever say shut up to my kid, I know that I got too angry and I feel bad after I say shut up, which is funny because back in the 70s when we grew up, like shut up was like not even a bad thing. If you right, right, you know, our parents said shut the fuck up, probably, and, right. al- now, and almost hit us. But is this something that's happening like every day, or is this something that's only happened twice, or is it something you know? That's the right. those are the main question because I actually had you know I used Adderall before, and I had a really bad experience on it. What I mean, was I, yours? What was your ex- bad experience? Well, I got basically what would happen is I first when I first took it for my ADHD, mm. I, uh, you know, worked great. And then after a while, it would wear off real fast. And I was like you kind of balancing it with something else at the time. I think it was Xanax or clonazepam. Mm-hmm. And it was became like this balancing act. And the more and more uh, the more I took Adderall, the more, you know, the faster it wore off. And I would have to try to balance it out. And I became very agitated when the Adderall would wear off. Mm hmm. You know, and like in that time period between balancing between taking the Adderall and taking the stuff, balancing it out and taking another Adderall, it becomes like a real tough balancing act. And I think coming off Adderall or when it starts to lose its effect can make you extremely agitated. Yeah, that's what that's what I think is happening. And then I listened to Craig Fitzsimmons podcast. I remember a few years ago, he talked a lot about being on this time released Adderall patch. Right. Yeah, I took I I took that too. Now, how does that does that just stay? I wanted. Is there some sort of version of ADD medication where it's just you're just on it and there's no coming down? Because my doctor said no, well, no, I there's can't. Not, that. I take it not because I, my experience with Adderall was really bad. I mean, like I became really dependent on it. I was like, you know, I my milligrams kept on going up and up to get the effect. I was like, I was a mess. I mean, I was a real mess it really you know had a negative impact on my life and my work and everything how quickly did it become a negative i would say probably within it's slow you know i mean you don't really notice it it's kind of like and i couldn't like tell you exact period but it's probably like i would say six months okay because i think i've been on it about that about six months to seven eight months right now and all of a sudden this is a new thing where i'm turning into that yeah that outburst version of myself but, uh, you know, I was on it, and I would, like, be up for days on it, and it was days? really... Yeah, I would be up for, like, you know, like, I would never get any sleep on it, and, like, you know, I was really... I was a mess, you know what I mean? I was not... <laughs> I was not taking it the right way, and, I, you know, it was just, like... It became addicted on it, to it, basically, you know? Yeah, Artie Lang has mentioned that to me, that he didn't, didn't like the idea of me being... Uh, it's a narcotic, depending. man. Yeah. It's a powerful narcotic. It's not something, you know, I'm not doubting that it can't help people. I'm mm-hmm. just, you know, like my experience was bad. That doesn't mean it's not right for somebody else. But right now I take a, you know, non-stimulant. You can take, there are non-stimulants. Oh, I you, know, I know. What do you take, Stratera? Yeah. How do you like, <laughs> I nailed it, nailed it in the first try. I know uh, all. All right. Wait, wait, listen, it's like, you know, when you go from Adderall to Stratera, it's like, you know, you're going from... <laughs> A completely different universe. It's like you know, you feel like it doesn't do anything. You know, like with Adderall, you feel like an immediate kind of effect. Oh Whereas yeah. Era, you're. It's going to take a while to get into your system, and really, I've had to. I, I almost think of it as like Stratera is probably like only a really minor 
part of how I treat my ADHD. The rest of it I treat through just behavioral management techniques. You know, I just have to do things a certain way and I have to force myself to do that without, you know, medication. So what are some of those things? Like uh, always having a schedule, you know, like uh, as far as because it's real easy for me to kind of get distracted and um, and start getting hyper focused on one thing. And mm. I would have to I always have like a to do list for the day. I, I try to keep my um, uh, keep, you know, myself on a schedule every day. I it's hard for me sometimes to um, take on big projects like and I get a little overwhelmed. So I'll, I'll start it. I use like a kitchen timer. And I'll, I'll put like it on 20 minutes or put it on my cell phone for 20 minutes. I'll say, I have to work on this project for 20 minutes, no matter what. And I got to do it right now. And eventually you kind of get engrossed in it and then it's okay. You know, right. so well, these, you- I mean, like I have like a bunch of other things I do that I, uh, that I have to kind of stick to, or else I can like waste the day away being distracted and like having all those ADHD symptoms come up. So I have to, I mean, I've really got to be disciplined, <laughs> disciplined every sure. day. Sure. Well, it's almost like uh, therapy, you know, it, like it, it, what you're saying reminds me of some woman who gave me her card once after a show. She basically was an ADD therapist. She, she thought she had ways to help people with ADD or ADHD without taking medication right. to really try to manage it. You need somebody, you know, who's hammering you over the head, but it's hard when you know there's here's a pill that you know all that stuff yeah. she's saying doesn't become so hard. You right, can do right. it well, now. I, it, you know, and the Adderall worked for me at first, but it, it's a powerful it's a powerful thing, man. Yeah. Like well, he, he, here's an example. Even today, like I, on Adderall, um, the last three days I don't usually get these, but I got a I got I guess you would call it a writing job. Basically, um, someone I know is uh, doing these corporate roasts, and he's hiring writers to write right. jokes for these um, corporations that he's doing roasts for. And basically, there's you know 13 people on this one that are working for the company that we have to write roast jokes for, and he had them fill out questionnaires. So, and there's 55 questions in these questionnaires, and I got to write jokes off of. I don't have to write a joke for every single answer, but I pick the ones that come to me and write jokes, okay? And he's like, spend about an hour on each person. So that's 13 hours of work right there, okay? And he's paying me an hourly fee. So I had about five of them done today, and he, and my deadline's tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. I went to Starbucks today. I was like, all right, I'm going to knock about five of these out right now. I'm going to work for five hours in Starbucks. I'm ready. As soon as I get to Starbucks, I, I write like two jokes. My phone rings. Right, right. It's this guy who works for an advertising company that um, has an, uh, a company that's interested in advertising on my podcast. And he starts explaining to me his company. I'm like, this, right. this couldn't come at a more perfect time for me right now because I'm on the fence with to do with my podcast. And this guy, is he was like you know, a guru for this stuff. He had, he knew so much and he was so interesting and I learned so much Dude, we talked for two hours. Right. Right. And now I'm looking at my clock. I'm like, my son's going to be off the bus in a half hour. Like, yeah. Yeah. That's on Adderall. I'm like, what the fuck? Sometimes I think Adderall might make me worse because it gets me, it gets me talking. I start talking right. too much. Did you ever have right. that? Yeah. You're just I mean, chatty like- as hell. Yeah, it becomes like I well, I would, you know, start cleaning the garage or something like that. <laughs> or I'd be in my office and I'd be like doing everything, everything but what I was really needed to do. And that's on you know? the meds. I thought that's the meds the were supposed to help. They don't they don't sometimes. You gotta manage it on top of it, I guess. Yeah, well you gotta you gotta be careful, man. You really I mean, you like the unfortunately the doctor I had was kind of a you know, he was too easy to manipulate and stuff, like to say, hey, you know, can I hire the dosage or, or anything? You really have to have somebody I think to have that check and balance for you. Well, now, n- nowadays they won't just hire it. Like it's so regulated. Like I, right, right. I had said to the guy, can we do something here? And you know what he ended up doing instead of giving me, you know, I wanted to try to do something where I don't have to remember to take a second pill. Can yeah. you, can you just give me a higher dose? Blah, 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 blah. What he ended up doing, he goes, you know what I can do? He goes, take the 10 in the morning and then I'm going to give you 20. So you, you'll have, uh, I can give you a whole month's worth of, of the tens and now you have a whole month's worth of the twenties. Right. He goes split the twenties in half and now you can take them three times during the day. Cause I was making fun of how I'm a comedian at night. How am I, right. you know, in the Adderall Your world. Hours are weird. Yeah. My, I, and then, then dude, I'm running into drinking alcohol at night to try to fall asleep. 
Yeah, that's, that's not good. Oh. Well, I had a I had a big problem going to sleep with uh, Adderall. You know, like it was because I would all I'd be like, yeah, I you know I'd be working during the evening and I'd be like, oh man, I got to get this done. Take a little bit of Adderall, and then all of a sudden I'm, you know, I'm still up at five a.m. just staring at the ceiling or you know or i, I don't know it just would drive you insane i mean it's just, it's my, tough man like the positive the, is is my garage looks amazing it's so <laughs> clean right now you can eat in my garage right now right but some of the stuff you talk about just being agitated i i relate to that as far as just you know that adderall once it wears down a little bit you know and start you're starting to go down it can be really it can get you agitated uh so like that's why i ask you is it are these just situations or is this the, is no. this like something that's happening regularly where you get start getting agitated? You, let's say you take it at 9 a.m. or 8 a.m. or whatever. You start getting agitated every day at 10, 15, 10, 30 when it starts wearing off. And, you know, like if it's a no. regular thing or is it just like a situation that happens? It was a situation. Like that's why it scared me because it just I found myself yelling at the, um, at the snowblower. And then when I calmed down, I realized – why am I getting mad? All I have to do is lift the snowblower and put it on a, an angle, and I can pour oil right into it. I'm being – I just spazzed out for no right. reason. Like my- well, I can, I can completely understand that because you bought a snowblower. You know what I mean? You spent a bunch of money. You're ready to do it. And, like, if you can't work it, that's got to be the most – I mean, I think I would flip out. You know, like, off the medication, on the med- – whatever, you know. Yeah, well- that would be – something what that would really uh drive me nuts like and it's, i deal with that with all these stupid uh like weed whackers and shit like that you know there's always something that's a problem with them no but i come from a long line of nice guys that snap like my dad <laughs> is my dad is the sweetest guy ever but he would he would have those isolated blow-ups and my brother does too he right he, my brother probably worse than me um He's kind of got it under control now, but yeah, he used to just fucking. Snap. Yeah, I've seen him snap at his kids or something. You're like, whoa! Right, right. Well, <laughs> it's in our it's in our genes, definitely. So, all right. Well, maybe you know. Okay, I'm I'm gonna try pulling the coffee off of it a little bit at first, and then who knows? Maybe I switch to the non-stimulant version and see what that yeah does. it's a big difference man you know like there's going to be it's it's like to get off adderall it's not it's especially if you've been on it for a while it's not like an easy thing it's not well at least it wasn't for me out to that you know i mean maybe it's easy for some people but for me it was like i could not just uh cold, cold turkey get off it it was it was something that would be a major blow to my system as far as just waking up and taking that Adderall and getting that initial boost. Yeah, it wakes like, you right up. You could get you could sleep for four hours. You got Adderall. You felt like you didn't. You felt like you had a full night's sleep. <laughs> right. Like, I'm great. Four hours. Let's do it. I could fly an airplane right now. <laughs> right. All right, Ron. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. Yeah. I'm just gonna have two of you guys this week. It's uh, kind of the way I'm gonna do the the podcast. I mean, uh, those surveys really told me a lot. Okay, and that's cool. It, and it looks like I'm going to try to mix the callers with the guests. So we got um we got a, right. I got a guest coming up who I already pre-recorded and he he gives some great advice and I give him some great advice on stuff. This guy Tom Rhodes, I don't know if you know him, really funny comic. Do you ever hear of him? Uh no, look, haven't heard of him. Look look him up. All right. Yeah, he had his own sitcom years ago. He used to have really long hair and he was like this rock star comedian. Yeah. And he has like short hair now and uh it's pr- he's a really interesting uh, funny guy. Um, so hey, did you? I was going to ask you. Did you and DePaulo notice? Uh, did you know DePaulo had uh, auditioned for the Kevin James sitcom? Like he had gone to a Kevin James audition. He read for it too. I, I don't know if it was the same part or anything, oh, but he I'm was sure just talking was. about. He was just talking about it on his podcast. So I know you guys. I just listened to you guys together. So I, I thought it was interesting. You guys didn't mention that at all. That's, oh, that would have been perfect. I didn't know that. Did he? Did he? He didn't say on his podcast like he was pissed because he didn't do well or something like that. No, he didn't say that. He didn't say anything like that. Yeah, he would never he, be that honest. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> But it was uh, it was hilarious like, that, that that Twitter mix up you guys had as far as you sent like putting out something about the comedians getting him getting all fired up. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. He thought I was talking about him. That's hilarious. <laughs> yeah. All right, dude. All right, buddy. Thanks for being a fan. Thanks for that. All right, Joe. And thanks, Take easy, buddy. Thanks for trying to fix me. Yeah, sure. <laughs> See you, buddy. Bye, bye. All right, there he was, Ron, in person. You got to see him, folks. Looks like a a young Roberto Duran. No Moss, Ron Poliquin. 
uh, obviously a uh, Nick DiPaolo fan and then uh, listens to my podcast too. And uh, we have a great guest coming up. I want to uh, go to him. And don't forget, February 13th, go to the Ritz, the Ritz Theater in Haddon Township, New Jersey. I'm doing a big show down there. Go to JoeMatterEast.com and buy some tickets. There's a few left, okay? It's a Saturday before Valentine's Day. If you haven't found something you want to do with your lady, go take her to see me on February 13th in South Jersey. If you live far from there, get a hotel, stay overnight, support me. I'd appreciate that. Or make a donation to the podcast. That'd be nice, too. You can get some free merch. Okay, everybody? We'll be right back with the very funny Tom Rhodes. And, I, and they and there's like a fancy uh, uh, white bookshelf behind you. Very dude. Uh, this is uh, I had everything in storage for ten years and just traveled the world. So the main thing I had in storage was my massive book collection. Holy shit! Nice. It's it's funny. It's getting to the point where we all start to know each other. Us stand up comedians, yeah. not not from hanging out and talking. From hearing you on somebody else's podcast. Oh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Actually, <laughs> you're, you're right. I'll hear guys I I know and love and uh, and I've known for years, and I'm like, wow, I never knew that about them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you you and I go way back, and I I think I'm was you were you on Marin's podcast talking about tra- you know, uh, traveling the world and not having a house, really just going from. Uh, country to country to city to city right was it yeah. Marin's? yeah and a few others and a few others and now are, are you like are you not traveling anymore as much are you more like in a in a in, in a spot now you live somewhere now <laughs> yeah i mean i'm still traveling but i um instead of every week going to a different city um i'm doing like one or two weeks a month like a normal american headliner you know um, but you and I met, I mid nineties, I'm guessing. And then I lived in New York, 98, 99. Okay. Then I moved to Amsterdam for five years. Right. And, and then I, and I threw everything into storage when I went to Amsterdam. And then I'm after Amsterdam, I, I lived in LA for two years and I was never here. And, uh, I was paying rent on a place I wasn't crazy about. So I got rid of all my furniture. I gave it to like comedians who I needed, who I knew needed stuff. Right. This guy, this guy needs a coffee table. This guy needs a TV. So I really reduced it to like my vinyl record collection, my bookshelf, uh, my book collection, um, and like family photos and you know personal shit. Right. Um, and then uh, for ten years, I just uh, traveled the world. Like last month, last year, I did. Five months in Europe, a month in Asia. The year before that, I did a month in Australia, a month in New Zealand. And then six months of the year just, you know, relentlessly hitting all over the United States, you know? Well, Jesus. I mean, I, it's funny when and I hear when I'm interviewing different guys, I'm like, oh, I should have had him on this episode. Like, I can remember, like, I don't know, maybe like 20 episodes ago talking about this exact subject, which was... Oh, I'm in a career where I can go to crazy, strange places that you could never go to. And only recently have I went to a couple of these places, and I'm always hearing these comedians. I might, it might have been when I had Maj Jabrani on my podcast, and he was telling me how much they love American comedy in, like, Denmark or, um, you know, these Scandinavian countries. And I was... And, and I think it was right before I was going to Israel to do comedy for 10 days. And I had an amazing experience in Israel performing. And, then, and it, it, sometimes it gets to the point where you come back to America and you're like, oh, God, we suck. We're, we're terrible. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not nice, <laughs> you know. Um, and you got you, you've gone everywhere. And, and how did you how did you transition into that? How did that happen? Well, you know, I was living in New York, 98, 99, and um, I had a sitcom on NBC, 96, 97, uh-huh. for one year. I remember that. That was, yeah. uh, so mis- I, you were I, like a teacher with long hair. 
Yeah, it was like Dead Poet Society. I was like the rebel teacher. Um, but uh, they wouldn't give me any jokes. The kids got all the jokes, and I was like the straight man on my own show. <laughs> it was kind of frustrating, you know? But uh, I had a – so well, I should back up. I lived in New York when I was 20 years old for one year like a dog okay. in Washington Heights. Uh, That's where my wife works. Okay. And I swore if I ever had any money, I'd live in New York with style. So when the sitcom finished, I got a rock star apartment in the Wall Street area. And I looked at that money as like my NBC artist grant. So aside from um, pissing away a lot of that money on uh, uh, Wall Street rent, right. I started to make uh, trips to London. Uh, Greg Proops and Rich Hall are good friends of mine. Both of them were over there doing that scene a lot. And they mm. thought that I would do well in London. So I started making systematic trips to London and doing uh, guest sets around town at the peripheral clubs until I felt like I had my sea legs and could go hit the the comedy store and the best clubs in London. See, that's smart. I did the actually the reverse thing. My first time performing in, abroad was in London, but I had got booked to do this TV show at the comedy store which was idiotic that I had never been I didn't ne I'd never been out of the United States now I'm like you said doing comedy at probably the best place there and and I don't have any practice sets that I was doing anywhere else Yeah and that's the best club in Europe too, I know man. I so, so I bombed my ass off You should have gone over a week before and done some guest sets around town you know? stupid I had no idea I was thinking oh my stuff will work they speak English it was so <laughs> stupid <laughs> They, dude, they almost booed me as I was walking up. What could go wrong? Yeah, and I, they almost booed me. It was when George Bush was president, that, and they announced in my intro that I was American. You know that yeah. they had a, you know, they had comics from all different countries, and I was representing America. And it was oh tough God. during the Bush years, and I was living in Amsterdam, and I was playing in London a lot, and a lot of those English comedians loved doing that they were just in the in the intro all they had to say was your next comedian is from america <laughs> yes. and like they didn't have to insinuate anything just that tone in the audience boo yeah. so like already you're against the ropes you know yeah i jeez i should have called tom rhodes up and you said hey i'm going over there what should i do but so i got in with london and then that led to gigs uh all over europe in Asia, Australia. Now there's a lot of American comedians doing these international tours, but um, back then it was uh, it was all primarily booked out of London. So London was the key to all the international travel for me. And the other thing that I noticed in London was the comedians there. It was almost like Boston in the uh, in the 80s where you would always hear these great comedians are in Boston and they never have to leave Boston. And they just because of that, because they could make a good living in Boston, they never branched out and never became these big stars. And London, I noticed when I went there, is they paid like twice twice as much as New York City. So there was like there was these comics in London that could make a pretty decent living being comedians and never have to leave the like that little uh I guess London area. Right? Yeah, um and if, if you set up like three or four sets in a night in London, uh you got this big wad of cash in your pocket. It was really thrilling. You yeah, know? I remember and, that. Uh, and, 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 you know, geographically, England is so small, these comedians, once they get uh, television exposure, they can set up these theater tours around England. And at any point, maybe not uh, Liverpool and Scotland, but almost from any point in England where they perform, they can drive home and sleep in their own bed in London that night. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah. And I, I, I was jealous of that. I remember I had always, even that's before I was married and before I had kids. And I can remember thinking, maybe I should move over here because I, I don't like traveling so much. I used to be really afraid of flying. And um, when really? I, I would get, yeah, I, and I would get depressed on the road, like, I I used to literally like freak out by Saturday night. Like I'd have to like give myself a pep talk to try to get that feeling of I want to go on stage. I don't. It's weird. 
Uh, you don't listen to my podcast, but like the whole fixing Joe thing is like a lot of different things that I try to fix on each episode or, or, or it's, it's best when it's one specific thing. And then I like my guests to kind of share a struggle, um, as with me that I can help them with as I'm interviewing you kind of about your life. So we kind of know where you're going, but like, what are we fixing today? Well, um, (laughs) Well, I I mean to to end what we were talking about there though, like um yeah, like I I I would have to give myself a pep talk and then I started taking medication about 5 or 6 years ago. I'm just catching you up so you know where I'm at. Cool. I take an antidepressant called Celexa, been on it for about 5 years, maybe longer, 6 or 7, and it really helped me and I enjoy doing comedy more, and I I used to blow up. I don't know if you knew me back in the days when I would get really angry on stage if they weren't with me. I couldn't handle it. Oh, yeah. I always thought that was entertaining, though. <laughs> Comics do like it. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a guy's personal meltdown to really <laughs> make other comedians laugh. And you're <laughs> one of those guys that brought relaxation to it. Like, you have that West Coastness, like... Hey, whatever, man. Just you just have that. I don't know where you grew up. That you I have that. I grew up in that. Florida. Is- uh, my um, uh, I was born in Washington D.C. My family's all from D.C. and uh, we moved to Florida when I was twelve. So I grew up uh, in or in the Orlando area, and that's where I started doing comedy, which is really weird because um, uh, people associate me with being Mister International or whatever, and um, and you're from Florida. <laughs> but- but yeah, I actually I, I really love Orlando. I think it's a, a a beautiful place to grow. So do I. I you turn your microphone volume down a little, or, or your computer volume a little, because I'm getting a little bit of echo back when I talk. I don't know if I don't know if it's I don't know if it's your microphone as much as your when you're listening to me. Lower the volume a little bit on your computer, oh, okay. like one or two notches. You got it. How's that? You still hear me? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and and that that's where traveling internationally comes up. Once I got rid of that anxiety that used to be in me that would make me get angry on stage and make me afraid on an airplane, once that went away, like it, it started with um, Xanax, I would take that on an airplane and that would chill me out. But then when I would get to the gig, my brain was messed up and I couldn't remember my material. Because, you know, back in the day when you were younger, you'd fly to these cities you got to perform that night. You're not flying the night before the gig. You're flying the day of the gig. And yeah. you, you just flew four and a half hours and you took Xanax so you could relax. And I'm standing on stage just bombing. I would do so bad on the Thursday nights because my brain from the Xanax was bad. And then I started taking an SSRI, they call it, Selexa. And a whole new me started coming in. And then I was like, fuck. And I, I remember the first long flight was Hawaii. I performed in Hawaii and took a 10-hour flight, and I was like, that wasn't bad. I'm f- I can do these now. And then I went to Israel, like I said, and had an amazing experience. And then I was like, well, where else can I go to do That's comedy? That's Israel, man. Uh, I've never done that gig for Avi, and I've asked him a few times. I don't know really? uh, what. Yeah. Uh, that's a gig that I've actively pursued. I would love to go to Israel. Oh, you would love it. How are the, how are the audiences? They're so good. You, you, it's one of those. I'm sure this is this is what's cool about going abroad, and you've mastered it, and you probably know. But if you're going to a place that you haven't been to, it probably takes you one or two shows, right? You, it, that's what it was in Israel. You're like, oh, like because you'd go to certain cities that were overly religious, where you know they're all you know you're, they're very orthodox, and if you just did, I mean, <laughs> this is how tight they would be with dirtiness like uh brian kiley you know brian kiley no he's a writer for conan and he's a he started in boston and he lives in la now and he's as clean as they come i mean squeaky and like if he, he had a joke that was like super not dirty and you could like feel he said he could feel the crowd like Ooh, you know, like, ooh, did you just, you just talked about sex. Like, so. Yeah, I heard you have to be really, really squeaky clean on it, which is remarkable to me because like, oh, you can handle, you know, um, you know, buses being blown up and terrorist acts, but you can't, um, you know, a a mild penis reference is going to 
topple your Apple cart. I don't. Know. <laughs> well, yeah, it's true, and and you know, and you you got the women. Hey, the I women. read the Bible. There's nothing but fucking going on in that. <laughs> It's one of the most filthy pornographic books ever written. Let's talk <laughs> but, about King David for a minute. But it is one of those gigs. Yeah, all over the place. It is one of those gigs, though, that like one city will be overly religious and then the next one isn't. So it's like you got to keep adjusting. I re- even like ca- Canada, the first time I went to Montreal, I'm like doing a joke about going to a community college growing up and they're staring at me. And then I realized... Oh, they don't have community college here. They don't call it that. They don't even have a low-level university. They have either no college or good college, no shit college. And you, you know, and th- another thing I learned from performing abroad is, oh, you can just ask questions when you don't know, and you can make that funny. You don't have to get mad that that they don't know what you're talking about. Well, for me, the exciting thing is that adjustment yeah. when you go to a different country and like so like what's funny in ireland isn't funny in england and holland and france so like for me going every week to a different city or a different country um that adjustment you have to make on stage it's terrifying and yet like really exhilarating like that's a a high that i really got off on on all this international travel yeah that's what we, yeah and then like what you lose uh, in references, you always gain in observations. Almost everywhere loves when a foreigner gives you their observations on something that they uh, you observed while you were there. Yeah. And like and like people go, oh wow, it's funny. I've lived here my whole life. I never thought of it that way. You know. Yeah, so. it's a, that's one thing they really get off on in Israel. You noticed it right away. That was almost what they would ask every time because we would do a Q&A all four comedians come out at the end and let you know you're usually in some sort of theater in a synagogue or something like that you know and and that's their first question you know what 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 did you observe that you didn't expect like that kind of thing and like you said for a comedian it's an automatic 10 new minutes it's like in the in five days you have 10 new minutes because there's you know a lot of your jokes don't work you got to come up with shit that you noticed. Yeah, I don't think I'll ever do that gig. I guess, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, I guess I'm a little too uh, Johnny Drag Strip for I, everybody. I, I don't think but, you're, you're not a dirty comedian. No, but I mean, like, um, the, okay, let me let me just lay a, a, a short, quick joke on you. Okay. Um, the, 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 I mean, come on. If this wouldn't work in Israel, you know, uh, I'm from Orlando. We have amusement parks, right? Uh-huh. There's an amusement park in Orlando called the Holy Land Experience. Uh And uh, what they've done is they've recreated ancient Jerusalem at a highway exit. And I have to say the place is very authentic because the parking lot is full of Palestinians and they can't get in. (laughs) They would laugh at that. (laughs) <laughs> they would. <laughs> they would. They would. La- they have a sense of humor about their country. They're not. And you know what I noticed? We weren't really doing shows for people that were born and bred in Israel. They were mostly American transplants. Almost all of them. The, 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 even crazier. I'd be in, like you said, Jerusalem, or I'd be in some town I can't even pronounce. And I would say I grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and eight people would clap. And I'm like, what? They're like, we, we're from there. It was like, what? Wow. And, and then, like, I live in New Rochelle, New York now. I met somebody in Israel, not only that knew New Rochelle, <laughs> he grew up on my same fucking street. I was like, what? Wow. He's like, yeah, I lived on a 36. I'm like, what? I live at 24. Like, it was just crazy. Wow. And Yeah, so. It feels kind of fancy, isn't it? That's uh upper crust I, I i wouldn't say that no okay. I, I, I oh you, you mean the people over there i've i've never been i just know it's kind of like the wealthy suburb of philadelphia right oh oh cherry hill. i'm thinking you're talking about israel israeli no, people cherry hill. yeah yeah uh cherry hill as is known as a very rich jewish town which is why the, so many people from cherry hill lived in these cities in israel it was crazy i for, you know i forgot until i got there oh i have a connection you know even now, I could st- I get booked at synagogues every once in a while. I don't love performing at them, but it's like I, every once in a while they're amazing. Like like it was in Israel the last night in Tel Aviv. Imagine having all these rules that you're like trying to work around for like eight shows, and then you hit the ninth one, and they're like, 
you could say whatever the fuck you want now. You could talk about fucking pussies if you want. I was like, really? They're like, Tel Aviv, it doesn't matter. And then you. It- yeah, Tel Aviv's supposed to be balls out, uh, fun party city. I, I lived, when I lived in Amsterdam for five years, um, a lot of Tel Avivians live in Amsterdam. And, and that's all I heard was, man, it's just like fun, party, 24 hour. And, and, it, and I heard for doing comedy there, you don't have to um, – they, they like it um, balls out. No, it might have been the best show I've ever had in my life, seriously. Uh, well, maybe I should just go to Tel Aviv. Yeah, you would like that. The, uh, imagine New York City. This is, how, this is what I would say Tel Aviv is. It's New York City – with uh the like if it was connected to the caribbean <laughs> like you're literally the the sand is butting up against the buildings you know it's just like crazy that you're in this big city eating this incredible food and all this stuff and you can you can also eat it on the beach while you're sitting there like n- not normally like in america if you're sitting on a beach you're eating some shitty food that costs a lot you know but there, it's like you're eating this authentic, like, <laughs> uh, pita bread and falafel, all this incredible Middle Eastern food while you're sitting on the, uh, on the sand at this, like, table. With, I can't even explain it, but it was, and the water is just like, it's, it, there's no waves. It's just like the most perfect beach you've ever seen. But there are loudspeakers on the beach cranking up scary announcements, which is a bit I ended up doing by the middle. Really? Yeah, by, by, by the middle of the week. That was true. Well, put your gas mask on. Yeah, it literally. That was the joke because they sound. It sounds like you're about to die when they're yelling in Hebrew. <laughs> and I, sw- you're like, you're like relaxing. Oh my god, this is a perfect moment in my life. And then, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I swear to God. Then the punchline, and this is true. The translation was, ladies and gentlemen, the lifeguards are now going home. Like I swear to God, I'm thinking tsunami. The, uh, uh, a rocket was launched right at us. Which that's another thing you get you you get used to when I was there. I had never been to a place where you're technically at war, kind of, and rockets were launched while I was there into the country. And the the people over there don't even bat an eye. They don't they don't care. They feel like they know they're safe. It's weird. Wow. But because of that, I think makes them warm, warm, more loving, uh, fun people to be around. Because of that, I feel that Americans. Uh, take for granted that they're safe and they act like assholes. You know, no one over there was an asshole. I didn't see any assholes. I did the Edinburgh Comedy Festival last year in Uh Scotland, and I made really good friends with this comedian. He lives in Jerusalem, and he's from Philadelphia. His name is Yisrael Campbell. You ever heard of this guy? He he probably met us when we were in Tel Aviv. A few of the Tel Aviv. He comedians. lives in Israel. He lives in Jerusalem. Oh, but Jerusalem. you should have him on your podcast. Really, really, really fascinating guy. Really cool dude. And, and he's, he's from, from Philly. Philly. Yeah, and uh, he did a show there called Circumcise Me. Uh, he really, <laughs> really. Fa- I had him uh, anyway. I I, I, I'll, I'll, look, look, I'll look him up. I don't want to spend my episode giving a plug for another guy, but he's a brilliant, beautiful human being. Yeah. And uh, so, so basically, we'll cut to uh, the issue. It's funny because I, I had this meeting, great meeting, accidental meeting with a guy that, you know, does a lot of the advertising for podcasters, which is, is starting to happen. The, these po- Our podcasts are starting to really surface. And it was funny from talking to this guy, I realized as I'm explaining to him my podcast and he said he's listened to a few episodes and I had told him that I ran a survey about my podcast on Twitter and my Facebook page because I was thinking of going to this like pay per listen kind of thing. And, yeah. I, and I wanted to see what the people listening thought. And then there were other questions in the survey. And one person in the survey said, hey, why don't you go back to how you used to talk about your your one problem with the guest and then you would help fix the guest a little bit like that. I liked it when you would do that with every guest. And I was like, oh, I guess I stopped. Did I stop doing that? And I didn't realize it. And as I'm talking to this guy who's in the advertising business, I'm realizing that's that's what my show is. Why did I get away from that? And, 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 and you know, if it, it helps if someone can explain what your show is to somebody to get more people listening. Oh, this is a guy that has his his listeners fix him and his his problems are kind of sometimes out there or sometimes generic 
That's your hook. That's better than, you know, oh, it's another podcast where a comedian's talking to another comedian. About comedians, yeah. yeah. Now, Like my, my podcast, I was, because I wanted to do this television show, um, I wanted to be, because I was traveling around the world and I have comedian friends all over the world, I wanted to be the Anthony Bourdain of comedy. And I was trying to make uh, a television show where, you know, instead of he checks out food, I would check out comedy scenes. I would highlight uh, a comedian from these different, uh, you know, countries around the world. And then also, does my stuff work in that country? That's you know, great, I thought that's a great idea. Nobody wanted to make this show. Really? But, but how long ago was that? Uh, I, it's been a couple of years since I pitched it. But my podcast was an extension of that idea. So um, I interviewed uh, comedians all over the world mm -hmm. in my travels. And I had the guy Yisrael Campbell on um, that I was telling you about. But now I, I live in Los Angeles and like all these comedians and Marin has already talked to everybody. So like now my podcast, I'm trying to just uh, go a different way with it and, and uh, uh, pour out knowledge nuggets and and um, things that I know. So, I mean, you have a easily definable uh, hook or uh, premise, sh shall we say, of, you know. Fixing Joe. Well, thank you. I mean, but I, I, I love, see, that's an idea. What you just explained sounds like a really identifiable hook and that I would listen to. Um, but, you know, I don't think you should look at it as Marin uh, has already talked to everybody. He didn't talk to everybody <laughs> about that, though, what you're saying. He didn't, you don't, unless he happened to have some comedian from Russia on and the guy explained in detail the comedy scene in Russia. I mean, you, see, one, uh, you should go, I don't know, I'm, I'm telling you, I sound like one of those guys who wrote a book. Read the chapter seven <laughs> in my book. I, I, I interviewed Owen Benjamin a couple weeks ago, who's a funny comic, and he kind of inspired me in the interview um, in a way that we can do these things that we used to try as comedians to turn into something the industry would want to make a TV show about. And now it's flipped where it's like, no, this is the, I'm doing the thing right now. Like, I don't need you to make a show about it. Like you don't need, if you wanted to do a show about you being the Anthony Bourdain, a comedy, you don't need a network to make it. Like you're that you're going to these places. Like, Owen Benjamin literally films shit. You got to. He has this documentary on his website. He just was films filming shit with this iPhone, and he turned it into a documentary. And you watch it, and you go, "This looks good enough. Like this looks like a documentary." And if you do it the right way, you can do things for almost nothing. You now I'm giving you advice. Yeah, now I'm fixing it. No, no, no. I made I made travel videos. Yeah, um, but you all yeah. over the world. Um, I made I've made you know little pilot versions of it and mini versions of it. Uh, I've made great clips on Cambodia, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, I've everywhere, seen, I've, Ireland. I've seen some of them on YouTube. I remember watching, it's, it's coming to me, I remember watching those because I am fascinated by different places. And um, so, so is there a way for you to make some sort of... Uh, I don't know, make that show without it being on television, being somehow like a documentary or something like that, like that you would see on Netflix. Uh, yeah, I, um, I mean, right, here's my pitch for you. I got it. I just got okay. it. Cause I'm noticing and you, you probably noticed this too. Comedians now aren't just doing comedy specials, especially when you see them on Netflix. I'm noticing a lot of them are documentary slash one hour specials. Yeah, like Todd Barry did that road tour thing or not road tour. That's David tell Todd. That was David tells documentary slash comedy did all these different gigs. And then Todd Barry did the all uh, crowd work thing. And it, it, you know, it showed him in his house and all that kind of stuff. And then Tig Nataro did something where she's doing comedy in all these like people's living rooms and shit all over the country. And, yeah. th and that was on Netflix. Like, that sounds like a, a great one hour special with you in all these different countries talking to all these different people. And then we see you performing in all these different countries. Is anyone, no one's really, no one's done a special where they're in different countries. I mean, Chris Rock did different states and he was just wearing a different outfit, but you're going yeah. to other countries. I would watch that. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, I need, I need to get, I need someone to get behind it because I was filming it myself. 
uh, all these years. I mm-hmm. called it extended arm productions. Yeah. I be- I, but hey, I'm- <laughs> you're like it's like you're doing selfies in every country. <laughs> How many hours of footage do you have from all these countries? Oh, mean- I've got, I've got, uh, I've got thousands of hours of footage of stuff and interviews I've filmed with comedians and stuff that I've shot all over the world and me and on on uh, uh, high definition camera I've filmed. Yeah, I, see, you you probably. With the right sit-down interviews that look pretty high end, and those don't cost a lot, you could probably cut them together with what you have, and you ha- and you have a, f- a film. You know, look look what look what Jeffrey Ross did. His is all low end when he went to perform for the troops. It was all like like you're saying with the camera, and that that was on Showtime and everything. I mean, he he did well with that. I don't know. I didn't see it, but <laughs> I'll go check it out. I think you fixed me. <laughs> I don't know if that's your dream project. <laughs> but so my issue, and, and you can maybe give me advice with this, because you're a pretty relaxed guy. And I, with the medication, have been really relaxed. But I started taking Adderall for ADD on top of this anti-anxiety wow. medication, right? Um, Took a long series of tests with Doc. Are you not having sex with your wife? I am having this. <laughs> What would that? Why, why, why the anxiety? <laughs> uh, it's it, kids a bedwetter. He's. Uh, I was a bedwetter. If that no, means your, anything, your kids are bedwetters. They're getting bullied at school. What's the? I don't get it. <laughs> See, you're relaxed people. They can never understand someone who's just born with anxiety. Like, what can make you they get really me mad? That struck me as a very confident guy, and you know, good-looking guy, muscular. You know, like. The, you know, neurotic and weird uh, uh, shaped head or body, you know? Well, th- they used to say that about Nick DiPaolo. They never understood why he would get so mad. They were like, he's got a model girlfriend, he's a handsome <laughs> guy, and he's yelling at people. It's like if you have oh, – I, I explain, and it just happened. That the, the, the main issue that I want to talk about today is – I don't know if it's the Adderall, if I'm drinking coffee mixed with Adderall. I thought I had the anxiety gone, and then all of a sudden this past week, you know, here in New York we got like over 25 inches of snow, and I, yeah. I, I bought a snow blower. This is, this is where it all went down. I buy the, I, for, for years I've wanted a snow blower. Finally I said, fuck it. I'm not shoveling anymore. I'm not hiring somebody to shovel. I'm getting a snow blower. I bought it. I felt good. I couldn't wait to use it. I realize you got to put oil in the snow blower. You can't just put the gas in. And I'm such an idiot. There's like an a hole for the oil on an angle at the bottom of the snow blower. It doesn't come with oil when you buy it. No, you got to you buy a separate little thing. They give you the little well, bottle you oil. Car, you expect it's going to have all the proper <laughs> fluids. What's the difference in a snow blower? Exactly, it didn't. I have to put the oil in. I don't have a funnel, and there's snow all over. I don't go buy a funnel. I start twisting this piece of plastic that I found in the trash, trying to shove it in the hole so I can pour the oil down. I cut my finger, and now I'm pouring oil into an open cut on my finger, and it it kills. I'm losing my mind. Thank God I'm in the garage. Back in the days, I used to lose my mind out loud in front of neighbors, and, like, they would be afraid of me. So I'm lo- I'm literally, like, it's like I'm a car that's overheating. in my. I'm in my garage... I'm like, I'm like the it's not coming out, but it's just internalizing, and I'm literally like making a fist, and veins are blowing out of my forehead, and I I think I go that's what it was I go in side to get a ladder from my wife because I need to get to this higher shelf in our garage where our shovel is because I think I might need a shovel for a couple spots. She comes to the door, and she didn't even say anything, and I just went. Like I just yelled in her face. She got scared because I had done it like two days earlier. And she just walked away from me. And I was like, I just scared my my wife hates when I do this. She can't handle it. I didn't grow up with a or my, my wife didn't grow up with anybody like me and how I get when I just lose my shit. And uh, I go back to the snowblower and I realize there's like an easy fix. All I have to do is is lift the snowblower up a little bit in the back, and now the hole's not on an angle. It's just straight up, and I just pour, you know, the oil in. It was easy. 
Yeah, it was it was easy. And I, I'm, I'm doing this in front of my kids, and I'm like, what the fuck? And I said to my wife, I go, do I need to up the Selexa medication that I take for anxiety? Do I need to not drink coffee in the morning when I take the, you know, Adderall is speed. I don't know if you've ever taken speed in your life. Not um, government sanctioned. <laughs> like what, though? Like just regular... Cr- was crank something that people you, you, you're like I, I feel like you're a guy that maybe uh, no, have tried I, a lot of drugs I, um, when i was living in new york uh 98 99 i had a lot of money and uh i was hanging out with mitch hedberg a lot and mm-hmm. we um we did a little bit of cocaine during okay. that period now is cocaine something that would ever make you yell could it ever get oh no, man i mean that shit's the worst um you know, it makes you retreat from people. It makes you, you know, lick your lips a lot, and um, uh, it makes you nervous. And then, and and for writing jokes, it was the worst. It was, um, you know, uh, Hedberg would have new material all the time, which was blew me away because, like, I thought it was the least creative drug ever. And then you always heard about Pryor felt very invincible on cocaine. For him, Pryor, for Pryor, cocaine like. Fueled his comedy, gave him confidence, gave him jokes. Um, I, you know, that's why I didn't stick with it. <laughs> so, you know, had it ever given me one joke, I... <laughs> I've heard I've heard more of your experience on cocaine than the Richard Pryor experience. More comedians say, "No, no, this is bad." Worst thing in the world for comedy. Yeah, yeah, it screws up your timing, makes you feel nervous. On stage, yeah, no, nah, it goes against everything that you've earned as, um, uh, you know, through practice and uh, perseverance. And was there a wear off to it? Like when it wore off, you were like, you would like, like be pissed off or anything like that when it would wear off? And yeah, I mean, like a lot of drugs just make you feel like shit and like a loser the next day. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Oh my- why did I do that? I was like talking to idiots until five in the morning about nothing, you know. Are there any drugs that don't do that? That you wake up and you go, I feel good. I feel fine. Um, um I have, I've had a few mushroom experiences where I felt, um, you know, uh, I had gained some secret answer to the universe. <laughs> But my, my wife, well, I should tell you, you know, I was partying so hard when I lived in New York City, I actually moved to Amsterdam to bring it down a notch, uh, <laughs> which, is, which is actually true. And Dutch people, my wife is from Holland, and, um, and she absolutely hates drugs of, uh, uh, of any kind and weed. Right. Uh, I stopped drinking uh, two years ago, and I stopped smoking cigarettes nine months ago. Oh, wow. So uh, I've had a pretty big transformation in the last few years. Stop drinking completely. Yeah. And no... So I was in Philadelphia. Um, I blacked out in a bar and fell off of a bar stool and hit a tile floor. I got six stitches on my forehead right here. It's looking better now. The first year, it looked like I had a vagina on my forehead. <laughs> um, and that was your wake-up call. Man, that was my wake-up call. Yeah, I was like, uh, I just saw so much ugliness in the mirror the next day. I had these Frankenstein stitches, and I had a black eye. And and then the last few years, I uh, I was starting to, you know, get that fat, white guy, alcoholic face. You know, that puffy, bloated face. Right. And, you know, I was always kind of a decent-looking guy. And, and then I, I and when I busted my head open... Um, I didn't have any insurance in, in any insurance. It cost me four thousand dollars. And um, but even before I got the bill, I had decided just the next day I was like, I was not put on this earth to be a drunk. You know, I was put here to do great things. So um, I and I, I didn't go to any AA meetings. Uh, I just yeah, I don't know. I mean, some people hit their head. And they, they automatically speak French. You've heard these <laughs> stories, right? <laughs> I hit my head, and I, I no longer uh, wanted to drink alcohol ever again in my life. Really? That was probably like you like hitting somebody while drunk driving. You know, like that just went, oh, whoa, I'm done. Did your, And your wife knew you when you were uh, drinking? Yeah, and um, we argue considerably less yeah. since I stopped. And especially since she doesn't at all. Yeah, well, she'll have a glass of wine like 
once every month or two. Now, you're not one of those guys that thinks he could still maybe have one glass of wine here and there. You don't, you know, no. not to dabble. No desire. And, you know, I, I, uh, I, I really know a lot about wine. Uh, I lived with a French woman years ago who taught me all about wine. I lived in Europe. I really love wine. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I, I enjoy picking out bottles for my wife, but um, I, I just don't want to drink it, you know. That's great. That's great. And she was probably like, she probably knew like from the moment she met you, if he can just not drink, he he's the greatest guy. There's this one thing. Does she ever? <laughs> does she ever suggest it? Yeah, she still finds reasons to be irritated. But... No, I mean, did she ever suggest the uh, not drinking when you were drinking? Like no, the... no, never. No, yeah. no, no. No, and one thing I found attractive about her was um, her ability to drink heavily. So she used to, um, she used to drink right with me. Oh, okay. See, my see, I'm at this stage uh, where uh, I worry about that sometimes with me because of the Adderall that I take that you know gets me focused, especially like where it comes becomes tricky is if I'm doing a podcast or somebody else's podcast at like eight or nine o'clock at night. I would. I want to be on the drug that helps my focus, right? Have a couple, yeah, 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 yeah. So, so what happens is, is when you take this drug Adderall, uh, you take it at eight o'clock. Now at twelve o'clock, you're still on it in your brain, and you can't go to sleep because you're up from the Adderall. So I would have a couple of glasses of wine, or I'd pour a couple of glasses of bourbon, or I have a few beers, and like. You know, my wife grew up with an alcoholic father, so it lights her up. If if she, I know if she came down a couple of the nights, like when she's sleeping and I'm like drinking something out of a bottle, not a glass, you know, she would, she would get really upset. And I, I, I don't, you know, I'm lucky I don't have the genes of the alcoholic. No one in my family is an, you know, an, an alcoholic. So I. I never like drinking eight drinks or anything, but um, I don't like that it's every day and it's a few drinks and then I ha I have it or I can't go to sleep. Well, my dad was um, uh, he always had a cocktail in his hand and um, he was the life of the party and I never saw anything wrong with it. And my dad was really funny and I always associated comedy with, oh man, you're the leader of the party. You know, you're the comedian. So I always associated the two together and the fact that um, we get free drinks everywhere we perform. I also looked at it as part of my payment. Like, oh, my God, if I'm not drinking 10 beverages a night, I'm not getting part of my pay. And um, I guess that's maturity. You know, I mean, I've been doing comedy for 32 years now. And, um, you know, I've I, I went from young, inexperienced guy to like you know, uh, successful guy. And then, you know, now older veteran and, um, and I don't know, I mean, it's interesting, the dynamic, you know, and you're in the clubs and there was some, I was at the improv last week and there was some young comedian, this girl, and she was plastered and she thought she was being witty to me, talking to me. And she was just like such an idiot. Yeah. And then also it's really powerful not to drink because everyone gives away all of their secrets. Yeah. You're talking to somebody and they have no idea. It's like, you know, and my password is my <laughs> name and my birthday. And they're just like, Tell me. <laughs> uh, that's exactly what my wife says. She's because that's what it is. I, I, I connect it with if you eat Chinese food and your wife doesn't eat Chinese food, she thinks your breath stinks. But if you both ate Chinese food, no one's breath stinks. So like if she's sober <laughs> and I had two drinks, even though it's just two drinks, I'm an idiot compared to her. So she and it's not the guy that she fell in love with. It's the two drink version of the guy. It's not that guy anymore. Like I get it why my wife would be turned off when I have a few drinks. You always have to remember and like my wife uh is really amazing. Uh and my wife's a photographer. Um and you know, she traveled with me. We've been together for seven years and um she traveled with me all over the world, you know, so every week we're going to a different city and, you know, I'm looking for jokes. She's taking photos and stuff. And we've had long conversations about this. And the thing you have to remember about your wife, like my wife, is your wife always wants you 
to be the smartest person in the room. You know, that's a good not point. the drunk idiot saying something inappropriate. You know, <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm never the smartest person in the world <laughs> in the room. She has she, my wife has a Ph.D. and is very intellectual. You've and never been able to take a compliment. That's what I like. About <laughs> no, but I'm no, I'm, I'm thinking the funny here is, is no, I think of the comedic angle instantly. But because of her family being so smart, her mom and dad are super intelligent. And so is my wife and her two sisters. So why would I want to make myself even stupider? You know, I'm already I'm already fighting to try to be kind of on their level. And you're going to drink like, what are you, an idiot? You, you shouldn't be drinking. No, you should be reading in a corner with a highlighter, you know. Uh, yeah, I almost think I have to pull an alcoholic move and not have it in my house. When I don't have it in my house, I don't drink. But I end up going buying it. I have it. And then when it's here, I want it. It's like you. Like, I don't want to waste it. You're going to angle. Are you going to show me you got, like, a case of wine right next to you? No, you gotta... I have a, uh, a prescription for you. <laughs> what is it? Non-alcoholic beer? <laughs> oh, a book? A 12-step book? Seneca. Seneca. What is Seneca? Seneca was a philosopher uh, during the Roman period, and... Uh, he was a Stoic, and there's a few things you reminded me when we were talking about anger before. So Seneca uh, said that drinking alcohol was self-induced insanity. That he, why would you make yourself insane? So right. I mean, I mean, but I read this shit when I was still drinking, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but he was a Stoic, and the Stoics believed that anger was a sign of weakness. That uh, you should you should have enough self control not to be angered by stupid people or things you know uh, the dude you know there's 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 not too much uh, too many books and they're all very thin it's you could just Google Seneca quotes and uh, and, and learn a lot but what's his most famous quote do you know it uh, the one off the top of my head is that drinking was self induced anger. Um, that is so true, though. That is. Yeah. So l l I'm going to I'll try reading those books. I mean, I, I, I love when people yeah, prescribe. Just, but, just, oh. just Google some quotes. You oh, know? OK, I, 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 don't, I, I don't uh, do that. Now, I, I want to ask you really quick before we and we'll ra we'll wrap up with the interview in this way, because it seems like you've beaten the alcohol and it's kind of got you to a really good place and you seem really happy. But like I said, you you've always seemed happy to me. Um, is Thanks. there, is there anything? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And is there anything that you still struggle with? Anything? It could be like your, uh, a how, anything. It doesn't have to be mental. It could be something in your house, anything. Yeah. I mean, I did have a, a, a few difficult years. Um, my Cur currently though, do you feel like, is there anything currently happening? Well, I mean, I have to tell you, you know, my, my father was killed by a drunk driver in 2009. Oh, wow. And it was a rich guy who got off with just a light probation. So I was angry about that. Uh, and then my, my little sister died of breast cancer in 2011. Oh my God. And then um, I was angry at God after that. I can see that. So I've always been a really happy guy and, um, n n you know, never bitter and just really enjoyed life and, and my life as a comedian. But for a couple of years after that, I had a lot of anger, and um, it, now I'm I'm out of it. Uh, I, I really I feel great again, and what? the fact that I'm I'm not drinking, um, it's just you know you see so many people and and comedians just getting consumed by anger, and that's why I brought up the thing about Seneca that the so Stoics looked at anger as. Um, as like a weakness that you should really just control yourself. You know, you cut yourself on a snow blower. I mean, fuck it. Buy another one Buy one, you know, uh, I don't know, but, uh, you know, my frustrations are, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm very doing very well these days. I'm happy to have a, a nest with my wife after traveling for so long. Um, I've been working on a book for the last few years about my life traveling the world as a comedian. And so, I mean, my frustrations are just that, you know, I, I wish it was already done. Right. You know, I still have 
a few more chapters to write and then you got to go back and uh, polish up your first draft kind of stuff. But I mean, I, you know, I've, I've got a, a great reputation as a comedian and I, uh, I can do gigs all over the world. I don't have t- uh, too much that, um, you know, it's not nothing's I'm, weighing you down right now. I can see it in your face. Just I, had, I, had, at some, I had some. I had a. a, a you had a, a tough stretch. Difficult couple of years, you know. Well, I've always known when you're, you're not you're not thinking about uh, writing jokes when you're uh, thinking about punching people out. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I I, I, ha- I have noticed I have noticed that when when we do have the unfortunate things of of losing somebody in your life that was close, there's something about it whenever it happens that it's this horrendously bad thing, but it opens something up in your brain usually. You know, especially you go, well, life is short. That always opens up. Like, okay, I'm gonna love more people because life is short. I mean. Um, I had my cousin, I, I had a first cousin who died last week and I didn't, I, I didn't even know him. I think I'd met him twice in my life and I know his brothers a little bit and I got a call and it, 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 it like jarred me, even though it was a cousin, I don't even know him, but it more jarred me cause I was like, fuck, I didn't know him. I was like. He's not, I don't, I didn't know him. Why didn't I know him? You know, like, so it opened that side of me, you know, and, 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 and it made me, you know, want to be with my wife or want to be with my kids. So that it does something, you know, so it seems like your anger pulled away and now you're at that place where you're like, you're like, okay, let's, let's really build what I do have. Right. Yeah. I mean, it makes you appreciate, um, not being uh, dealing with tragedies. I think that's the, the toughest thing about being a comedian is when you have shit going on in your life, like a heartbreak with a relationship or like someone close to you that you love dies um, to, to, you know, still go on stage. Um, I mean, it did feel good to put my brain on a shelf uh, during the grief and sorrow period, but I'm, I'm happy it's behind me. Yeah, that's great. That's great. So, uh, do you, what would you like to plug on the Fixing Joe podcast? It sounds like you're, you're well. You're writing a book, and you have your podcast, which is called Tom Rhodes Radio. Tom Rhodes Radio. Are you on All Things Comedy? Also, you I are, am. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, we're both over there. And I've been uh, another good thing about finally having a house is I can be more creative. Um, you know the, you know it was it was it was great traveling, but every week we'd go to a different city, and then you know new group of comedian friends to hang out with and and all this stuff i've been making these videos i've been putting them out uh once a week called knowledge nuggets and they're just uh you know i love to read and i'm just full of like different knowledge Uh so they're only like two minutes long um i'll give you an example uh uh shakespeare so these are like the knowledge nuggets i've been doing making these videos and um shakespeare's competition when Shakespeare was first putting on uh, these classic works of English literature uh, at the Globe Theatre in London, his primary competition at the other theatres around the Globe Theatre were shows where live animals fought to the death. And one of the most popular ones was a show where they would take a monkey and put it on top of a horse in a, in a theatre. <laughs> and then they would take like five dogs that haven't eaten in a week and let them loose, and the dogs would claw the horse to death trying to get at the monkey, and the show wasn't over until the monkey was dead. So think about that. You know, you think you got, like, difficulties in show business. You know, at least we don't have to compete with, you know, uh, live animals fighting to the death. And, 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 you know, it must have been very difficult to remove monkey blood and monkey brain from your 15th century English ruffle clothing. <laughs> So like so I'm making so I'm really I'm I'm really enjoying um making these videos, you know. And my wife films them and um she edits my podcast and stuff. So, you know, we're a good little unit. That sounds like it. Well, mom and pop business. I'm dying to meet your wife someday. Yeah, in Philadelphia, man, I uh Are you, you know, coming you out here? Just had on. I I I kind of get this smile on my face now 
uh, whenever I hear the word Philadelphia or see like um, uh, a sports team, uh, because my life was forever changed, when I busted my head open in Philadelphia, uh-huh. uh, I, I, I really consider that one of the greatest things that ever happened to me in my life. That's crazy. Are you the hear fact f- that I just like stopped drinking instantly. You hear and- I, I read Michael J. Fox's memoir years ago, and he actually thanks Parkinson's disease. He thinks it, it was life changing. He said, I was an asshole before I had this. Wow. He said, the first thing to go when you have Parkinson's is um, your vanity. He goes, if you give a shit about the way you look and you have Parkinson's disease, it's going to be a cruel rest of your life. Wow. He's like, I could give a shit anymore about that. That's not important. And uh, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. And, and I love life moments where a negative turns into a positive, you know. Um, dude, thanks so much. And wh- wh- where can they get the videos, though? Are they on your website? Yeah, my, my, uh, my website is tomroads.net, but my YouTube channel... Um, is called King of Ha Ha, or you could just type in Tom Rhodes. Tom and Rhodes. It pops up. Um, but yeah, my, my YouTube channel, I put out the Knowledge Nugget videos once a week. I put out um, an episode of my podcast once a week. Uh, I think it's never been a better time to be a comedian. It's, it, you're right. You don't need, you don't need um, suits at networks to approve anything that you're making. And it's really like the golden age renaissance for stand up comedy, you know. Mm-hmm. Thankfully the world is so fucked up now that people really need laughter and everything. But if you're a creative person, you know, you can do anything now. It's really great. Yeah, I look at Twitter as it's like your network. It's like, okay, here you go. I'm sh- here's something I want to show you. Like tweet tweet me your newest video and I'll uh, retweet it. Or I'll yeah, I guess that's how you do it. I would retweet okay. it to all my Twitter people. It was about Thomas Edison. Okay, send it over. I love shit like this because it's like a funny way. If I can learn through funny, I always know it. Like my wife will be amazed sometimes at the shit I know, and I'm like, I learned that because I heard uh, Dennis Miller do a joke about moment shots. Like it's like weird how I just know it from a comedy thing, and I, I, I love, love it. I love comedy where you learn stuff. Oh, yeah. uh, Thomas Edison invented the light bulb, but he didn't want to make money selling light bulbs. He wanted to make money selling electricity. And his main competition was from George Westinghouse. So there was only about a dozen power stations in the Northeast United States, him, Westinghouse and Edison making these things. So <clears throat> at the same time, people thought that the 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 hanging capital punishment uh, was cruel and inhumane. So people thought that electrocuting people to death might be a nicer way to murder people in the United States. <laughs> Edison was vehemently against capital punishment, but he secretly funded the development of the electric chair using Westinghouse electricity because he wanted it to be in the minds of Americans that Westinghouse electricity will kill you. And Edison put on demonstrations with the electric chair where he murdered dogs, horses, and once in Coney Island, New York, he electrocuted a circus elephant named Topsy to death. Now, kind of a, you know, you know, an evil twisted thing to do, but like genius marketing, you know, (laughs) just so he could get an upper hand in, in, uh, in business. Isn't that amazing? So those are like, maybe I should make a TV show out of knowledge nuggets. Or something. Well, it sounds like a history show, history channel show waiting to happen. Like you and Colin Quinn together, comedically taking us, uh, teaching us about history is, 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 a, is a classic. Wow. Infotainment. Write the book. I will. You don't need them. <laughs> That's right. Hey, Joe, I miss you, man. It's great to see you. I should come to, to New York more often. Yeah, you should, or I want to do your podcast. That's uh, I would love love to have you on. You ever come to do it, do you have Central to, Town? You can't do it this way? Oh, yeah. That, <laughs> could hey, you do it this way? I could, actually. <laughs> what am I saying? We, we have technology. Yeah. We can do anything we want. Yeah. I don't have to in New York. Yeah, I, I, I would love to do your podcast. Okay, let's, let's make a date. I would yeah. love to have you on. Do you want to make the date now, or you want to email me? You want to email me? Or do yeah, you want to make the date uh, now? Uh, uh, you don't look like a guy that has his calendar in his brain. I do have my Do calendar. you really? You know. You know when you want to do it. Yeah. Uh, February, I'm pretty slammed. Let's shoot for... Because now what? January's over now. Do you have a certain day you do it on? 
No. I mean, I put them out on Tuesday, but I can record them anytime. Oh, okay. So. All right, we'll do it in March. Okay. Well, uh, yeah, or there's a couple days in February we can do it. Okay. I'll, uh, let's, uh, we'll pick a date. Okay, definitely. I would love to do it. And uh, go listen to Tom Rhodes' stuff and watch these videos, these little uh, what knowledge, do you call- nuggets. knowledge nuggets with Tom Rhodes. I love it. <laughs> Dude, great talking to you. Hey, great talking to you too, Joe. I, it makes me realize, you know, how much further I'm past uh, a black period in my life uh, talking to you. You fixed me, man. <laughs> you were already. I could. You 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 showed up fixed. <laughs> All right, dude. A good talking to you. And, All right, brother. Uh, I'll Respect. see you later. Fucking love that guy. What a fucking good guy. Always loved Tom Rhodes. Always had his. It seemed like he had his head screwed on the way I wanted it screwed on. I think you could hear it in the interview. Go check out all his stuff. Tom Rhodes. R-H-O-D-E-S is how he spells his last name. R-H-O-D-E-S. Tom Rhodes. One of my favorites. Hilarious comedian. And uh, one of those dudes would be fun to hang out with, huh? Knows a lot. Intelligent man. Um... Uh, as we said at the beginning of the podcast, still plugging my February 13th date. Love to have you. Go to JoeMatterEast.com. Buy tickets to that wonderful theater called the Ritz Theater in Haddon Township, New Jersey. The day before Valentine's Day, still some tickets left. Not a lot. Still some. Okay? Still trying to figure out who's the opener. Who's it going to be? Who is it going to be? I don't know. I don't know. I hope by uh, me and Tom trying to fix ourselves, we help fix you guys that were listening. I hope our advice transferred, is that the right word, into your lives. I hope you feel a little better now after listening to this podcast. I love my wife. I love my kids. And keep downloading the podcast, everybody. And uh, follow us on Twitter. I'm at the Joe Matteris. Send me a little donation. I'd appreciate that. JoeMatterese.com. Click on the donate button and you get some free merch with all your donations. It's all explained there on my website. Okay, everybody. You have a great rest of your week. All right. Oh, yeah. I'm only doing one a week now. Did I tell you that? One a week. The two a week? I don't know. just didn't feel right. We're doing one a week. A lot more to explain. But keep listening, everybody. Take it easy. Love you guys.